All right, so we're getting very close to the end of this lesson on the listing and purchase agreements here in this 30-hour post-licensing course. Uh, but there are a couple other things I want to talk about that you need to keep in your mind with this whole closing that could potentially happen um, and you may want to think about during the writing of the offer or the receipt of the offer. And those are that properties occasionally or more than occasionally now have homeowners association and there are certain things that are required in the homeowners association or a condo. One of them is the delivery of the documents. Now this is the section in the H or in the purchase agreement that talks about the HOA that I think a lot of agents fill in the three blanks, but don't necessarily even remember to think about it or understand how important it could be. There is a section in the Indiana Purchase Agreement. It says that the seller will get the buyer the documents within blank number of days. The buyer will have a blank number of days to review the documents, and then it will have a blank number of days to respond. Um, so it is incumbent upon the seller to hit those deadlines to make sure that they give the buyer the HOA documents so the buyer can read them. Because in essence, remember, when the buyer closes, he will sign off saying that he agrees to the homeowners association or the COA, the condo, condo uh, owners association which are virtually the same thing. So the buyer actually has to read the HOAs to make sure that he in fact does agree to everything. Uh, I know I had a deal several years ago <clears throat> that did not close solely because of the HOA requirement that they could not put a boat or store a boat more than 72 hours in the driveway. And my buyer was a big boat enthusiast, and that actually virtually was the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, there were some other issues, but this is the one we just couldn't overcome, and it eventually became uh, the end. So remember that there is a delivery of those documents from the seller to the owner, or seller to the buyer, to make sure the buyer gets to read those. And the buyer actually has to sign off and say he agrees <clears throat> because he will at the closing. Now, I do know, or I'm pretty sure that Chicago Title and I think one other title company here actually has all of the homeowners associations on a database. So whether you're using Chicago or not, <clears throat> you can access their website to get and download your seller's HOA documents if they don't have that, all right? Now, there's gonna be some endorsements on your closing as well, so let's look at some of the endorsements. The big one is the condo association endorsement, and this condo association endorsement just basically stipulates that the, uh, to the lender. It's only for the loan policy or the lender's policy. You will notice this does not is not on the seller side. <clears throat> it, it's available only for the loan. It provides a coverage to the mortgage lender whose loan is secured by a condo. So if your buyer is buying a condo, this is going to be an endorsement or an add on is a way to think of that an endorsement is nothing more than an extension of the policy which covers something that may not be talked about. So they have COA endorsements or condo endorsements. And what this is basically saying is that it is a letter to protect the lender saying that the condominium that the buyer is buying was created in accordance with the state law and that there are no outstanding liens that would have a priority over the lender's soon-to-be first lien. All right, so that's a condo endorsement that you might see or get. And they're going to have to sign off. 
Now, here's the big thing that a lot of people get heartburns with, and I'm telling you I agree with this. All condo associations and homeowners associations actually have a transfer fee mandated to transfer the owner of record to the new owner coming on. This is not a uh, negotiable piece of the contract. The buyer should pay for this, okay? Now, how much is the fee going to be? It can range from $200 to $300. Unfortunately, there's nothing mandating in any state about the maximum price. However, Indiana does have some state guidelines to help protect you as the buyer to make sure that they're not going to be charged an overly high transfer fee. Now, I'm not sure what overly high means, if that's 500 or is that 5,000. All I know is it has to be of reasonable value for what the work service they're providing. So that is the transfer fee that will be charged and it is not even discussed in the purchase agreement. Now, if you're doing a net to buyer or a net cost to buyer or a net to seller sheet, uh, well, it won't affect the net to seller sheet because the buyer's paying that. Do not forget that there is a fee to transfer that HOA or condo over, all right? In our purchase agreement, we got other provisions and we've got further conditions. The only thing I will tell you about these two here is do not practice law we can get caught up in something very confusing here where we're taught not to practice law and we already discussed the ruling way back in 1963 that said we can fill in blanks. However, under further conditions, a lot of agents wanna start writing stuff in, all right? That confuses me and I'm telling you right now I have no answer because it seems to me if you're writing stuff in under further conditions, that's practicing law. The one thing I will tell you when you do this, and I noticed you did, didn't hear me say if you do this, because you all will. When you do this, make sure you just write it in plain language. Do not try and get legalistic or legalese uh, in there where it says the party of the first part does hereby require the party of the second part to submit said document in accordance with, you know, just say, hey, well, the buyer's going to provide, you know, this and the seller's going to provide the HOA documents or whatever, whatever you're going to say in there. Do not, do not make it look like you're trying to practice law because if they come after you, that sure is gonna be a hell of a lot easier case to prove if they see that you're actually trying to use legalistic terms and legalistic words that you were in fact practicing law. Um, the, the offer, the purchase agreement has to be signed by all parties, all parties that are listed on the purchase agreement if it's you know tenants in common or joint tenants or a husband and wife uh, or a single person or a corporation, whoever it is that was named on the purchase agreement also needs to be named and sign that purchase agreement. You can't have like a husband and wife going on title and only one person signing, all right? Now, here's the next question that talks about when a purchase agreement expires or if a contingency date gets passed or something to that effect. There is a lot of questions about how do I write uh, a contingency to make sure that nothing happens. And here's the way to do this. There's questions about, well, if it expired on Monday, you know, I'll get this down sometime. If it expired on Monday, and Tuesday I go out, can I just write something about uh, offer extended till Tuesday as my first counterpoint? Well, I'm here to tell you that 
one, I am not a practicing attorney. Two is, we've talked before, that once that contract expired on Monday, I am not sure if you can actually write an amendment that unexpires something. You know, I don't even know if that's a case. I personally would seek out a new contract, all right? Rather than trying to write an amendment that unexpires something in this manner, okay? Now, if your managing broker says he's fine with that and he's willing to take the risk or your sellers or buyer, depending on which side is fine with that, that's going to be upon you. I personally would never do this. I would not do that. I would write a whole new offer, all right? Because I don't believe that you can unexpire something. Um, now, if you continue to no negotiate in good faith, there is that possibility that the judge will uphold that. And what I mean by that is if your date, your time was five o'clock and you responded at six o'clock and they countered back again at seven and continued to negotiate, the fact is you missed a deadline and they came still continued in good faith. I have heard, I have read one court ruling where the judge upheld that the seller came back at a later time and said, well, you missed the, the deadline three counters ago, so we're actually out of contract. And the judge upheld for the buyer saying, no, you continued to negotiate in good faith. Therefore, the fact they missed that deadline is irrelevant. And I know that that sounds like it flies directly in the face of what I just told you about unexpiring something. So, and if you remember, I told you this is confusing. I would seek out your managing broker's preference on what he wants you to do in a case like that. I typically have my agents write a new contract or seek another contract rather than trying to do this, unexpire something. <clears throat> now, we're going to talk a little bit about procuring costs, so we're going to come right back and talk about that, and we'll hold on for just a second.